Hello, everybody. Uh, this is Chaplain Bob Walker, Light of the World Ministries. In John 8, 12, Jesus said, I am the light of the world. He that followeth me shall not walk in darkness, but shall have the light of life. And Jesus is that light of life. This is going to be an expose of Islam, Muslims, and Sharia law. And Sharia law is incompatible with the Constitution of the United States as we know it. I am an American, grew up in the United States, born here, and a lot of the atheists will complain and say it's not true, but the majority of people who helped form the Constitution and Bill of Rights of this country were Christians. As a matter of fact, the American Bible Society was created by the United States Congress when George Washington was president, and they took public money and printed, wait for it, American Bible Society. Hmm, what do you think they printed? Oh, 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 I know, teacher. Bibles! Yay, $64,000 question. You get the prize. That's right, Congress, the United States Congress. Nowadays, if they did that, the atheists would be screaming, oh, separation of church and state, separation of church and state. But, uh, you know, what can I tell you? Now, before I go on and expose the Muslims, let me tell you one of the few good things that I actually agree with them on, partly, partly agree with. They say that Jesus was a sinless prophet. I could agree with that. Jesus was without sin, and he was a prophet, among other things. Because he died for us, he was also priest, and one day he's going to be the coming king. He's also Emmanuel, which means God with us. And if you're interested, I did studies on all those things. I did an entire study on who was Jesus. Just type in Chaplain Bob Walker. Who was Jesus? Who is Jesus? In YouTube, the search bar, and you'll find my studies. I did about seven or eight hours of them. But, but where the Muslims stop, you know, well, Jesus was a sinless prophet. No, he, he was, but he was much more. He said, before Abraham was, I am. Matter of fact, let's read a few of those things before we go on to expose. In the 8th eight, chapter of John, John chapter 8, verse 56. As a matter of fact, Every Christian should read John chapter 8. Every Christian should read this chapter. It would take you five minutes, if that. Every Christian should read this because they don't read this chapter in churches. Jesus speaking, John chapter 8, verse 56. Your father Abraham, Jesus is speaking to the Jews. Your father Abraham rejoiced to see my day, and he saw it and was glad. Then said the Jews unto him, pretty obvious who he's speaking to, right? Then said the Jews unto him, Thou art not yet fifty years old, and hast thou seen Abraham? Jesus said unto them, Verily, verily, I say unto you, before Abraham was, I am. See, Jesus was identifying himself with the I am of the Old Testament. When Moses was speaking to the Lord, God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, he asked the Lord, he said, 
when the children of Israel were, will, will ask me, what is your name? What am I going to tell them? We'll get to that. So Jesus said unto them, Verily, verily, I say to you, before Abraham was, I am. Then took they up stones to cast at him. But Jesus hid himself and went out of the temple, going through the midst of them, and so passed by. So, evidently, the Jews thought that Jesus was blaspheming because he said, before Abraham was, I am. So he was saying that he was in the creation before Abraham, which lived, what, maybe over a thousand years before this day? All right, let's turn to Exodus chapter 3 and verse 12. And he said, who? God. And he said, certainly I will be with thee, and this shall be a token unto thee that I have sent thee when thou hast brought forth the people out of Egypt. Ye shall serve God upon this mountain. And Moses said unto God, Behold, when I come unto the children of Israel, and shall say unto them, The God of your fathers hath sent me unto you, and they shall say to me, What is his name? What shall I say unto them? And God said unto Moses, I am that I am. And he said, Thus shalt thou say unto the children of Israel, I am hath sent me unto you. You see, well, let's read verse 15. And God said moreover unto Moses, Thou shalt, thus shalt thou say unto the children of Israel, The Lord God of your fathers, the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, and the God of Jacob hath sent me unto you. This is my name forever. This is my name forever. And this is my memorial unto all generations. See, that's one of his names. I am. I am that I am. And he said, Thus shalt thou say unto the children of Israel, I am hath sent me unto you. You see, when Jesus said before to the Jews, he said, Before Abraham was, I am. Don't think that they didn't understand what he was referring to. He was referring here to Genesis 3 when, you know, Moses asked the Lord God his name. You know, so they understood, believe me. All right, so let's get back to Islam being false. And I'm going to use the Bible. All right, let's go to the book of John, chapter 19, the trial of Jesus. We're going to read verse 1. John, chapter 19, verse 1. You know... If you're a Christian and you've never read the entire Bible, uh, you're going to probably have some problems. Matter of fact, if Satan can convince you to do an unpardonable sin, God might just throw you into hell. You don't believe that, do you? I know, you've been told by every church, all you got to do is believe on Jesus. Believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and thou shalt be saved. And that's true. I believe that. But Jesus also said, Verily, verily, I say unto you, except a man be born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. Have you been born again? Jesus told that. Let's take a look at John chapter 3, verse uh, John chapter 3, verse 1. There was a man of the Pharisees. Now, what were the Pharisees? The Pharisees were a denomination of Jews, uh, much like the you've got Baptists, you've got Pentecostals, you've got Methodists, you've got Lutherans. Uh, you know, they're all denominations of the church. 
Well, a Pharisee was a denomination of Jews. All Pharisees were Jews, but not all Jews were Pharisees. Just like all Bible-believing, born-again Baptists are Christians, but not all Christians are Baptists, right? There was a man of the Pharisees named Nicodemus, a ruler of the Jews. The same came to Jesus by night. Why did he come to Jesus by night? Because he didn't probably want to be recognized, right? The same came to Jesus by night and said unto him, Rabbi, we know that thou art a teacher come from God, for no man can do these miracles that thou doest, except God be with him. Hmm. Jesus answered and said unto him, Verily, verily, I say unto thee, except a man be born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. Nicodemus saith unto him, How can a man be born when he is old? Can he enter the second time into his mother's womb and be born? Jesus answered, Verily, verily, I say unto thee, except a man be born of water and of the Spirit, he cannot enter into the kingdom of God. That which is born of the flesh is flesh, and that which is born of the Spirit is spirit. Marvel not that I say unto thee, ye must be born again. You see, people, if you're not born again of the Spirit, I mean, let's face it. In the book of James, it says, Believest thou that there is one God? Thou doest well. Even the devils believe and tremble. Satan believes in God. You know, we have to be born again. In 1 Peter 1 and verse 23, it says, Being born again, not of corruptible seed, not of this flesh. Being born again, not of corruptible seed, but of incorruptible, by the word of God, which liveth and abideth forever. All right, let's go back to John chapter 19, verse 1. Now, this is the trial of Jesus. Jesus was taken in the garden, betrayed by Judas. Uh, he was taken to uh, Caiaphas. I think it was Caiaphas, uh, the, uh, the high priest, the Jewish high priest. And uh, they basically accused him of heresy, and then they delivered him unto Pilate, who was the Roman governor of Judea, and they wanted him to be crucified. They wanted to kill him for, you know, as a troublemaker. All right, so, John 19, verse 1. So, then Pilate therefore took Jesus and scourged him. That means they whipped him. They beat him to a pulp. And the soldiers plaited a crown of thorns and put it on his head. And they put on him a purple robe. What is purple? Purple is the color of royalty. You know, they put a crown of thorns on his head. Probably pushed it into his skin so he bleeds as the crowns pierced his skin. And they put on him a purple robe. And said, Hail, King of the Jews! And they smote him with their hands. Pilate therefore went forth again and said, saith unto them, Behold, I bring him forth to you, that ye may know that I find no fault in him. So, wait a minute. Pilate's the Roman governor here. And he says, Behold, I bring him forth to you, that ye may know that I find no fault in him. Wait a minute. The church has always told me that uh, uh, Pilate was responsible for crucifying Jesus. What's this? Huh. Then came Jesus forth, wearing the crown of thorns and the purple robe, and Pilate saith unto him, Behold the man. When the chief priests, therefore, the chief priests, are these Catholic priests? No. The Catholic Church didn't even 
doesn't even exist. What kind of priests are these? These are the Jewish priests. They're the priests that are the head of the, the temple that Herod built. When the chief, were verse 6, when the chief priests, therefore, and officers saw him, they cried out, saying, Crucify him! Crucify him! Pilate saith unto them, Take ye him and crucify him, for I find no fault in him. The Jews answered him. Oh, wait a minute. Yeah, this, this tells you who's, who's speaking. Pilate saith unto them, Take ye him and crucify him, for I find no fault in him. The Jews answered him, We have a law, and by our law he ought to die, because he made himself the Son of God. When Pilate therefore heard that saying, he was the more afraid. Wow. So the Jews said that Jesus called himself the Son of God. And Pilate, when he heard that, he was even more afraid. How do you like that? An unsaved sinner like Pilate was fearful. He was afraid. But the Jews that knew the law, they weren't afraid. When Pilate heard that saying, he was the more afraid, and went again into the judgment hall, and saith unto Jesus, Whence art thou? In other words, who are you? Whence art thou? You know, that's the modern translation. Who are you? What's going on? Whence art thou? But Jesus gave him no answer. Then saith Pilate unto him, Speakest thou not unto me? Knowest thou not that I have power to crucify thee? And have power to release thee? Jesus answered, Thou couldst have no power at all against me, except it were given thee from above. Therefore, he that delivered me unto thee hath the greater sin. Now, who delivered Jesus unto Pilate? The chief priests, the Jews did. Jesus said, therefore, he that delivered me unto thee hath the greater sin. And from thenceforth, Pilate sought to release him. Now, I'm reading from the King James Bible. You know the Bible that the Baptists all swear that this is the word of God without error, perfect. And I wouldn't argue with them. I wouldn't argue. I agree. I, I, I believe the King James Bible, every word from the front page where it says Holy Bible to Genesis 1-1, in the beginning God, to Revelation 22. I believe every word. Verse 12. And from thenceforth Pilate sought to release him. Release who? Release Jesus. But the Jews cried out, saying, If thou let this man go, Thou art not Caesar's friend. Whosoever maketh himself a king speaketh against Caesar. You see, the Jews are accusing Pilate that if you let this guy go, that he claimed, Jesus claims to be a king, and Caesar, you know, the, the king of Rome, the Roman government, he was king. See, they're saying, Pilate, you let this guy go, we're going to accuse you of treason by saying Christ made himself out to be a king and you let him go when Caesar is the king. Did you know that treason under Roman law was punishable by death? So here it is, Pilate wanted to let Jesus go and it's the Jews that are accusing him that if they let Jesus go, that Jesus made himself out to be a king, and they're going to accuse Pilate of treason. Hmm. If thou, but the Jews cried out, saying, If thou let this man go, thou art not Caesar's friend. Whosoever maketh himself a king speaketh against Caesar. When Pilate therefore heard that saying, 
He brought Jesus forth and set him down in the judgment seat in a place that is called the pavement, but in the Hebrew, Gabbatha. And it was the preparation of Passover. And about the sixth hour he saith unto the Jews, Behold your king. But they cried out, Away with him! Away with him! Crucify him! Pilate saith unto them, Shall I crucify your king? But the chief priests answered, What priests? The Jewish priests. Not the Catholic priests. They don't even exist. The chief priests answered, We have no king but Caesar. Then delivered he him, therefore unto them to be crucified. And they took Jesus and led him away. And he bearing his cross went forth into a place called the place of a skull, which is called in the Hebrew Gol Golgotha, where they crucified him and two other with him on either side one and Jesus in the midst. And Pilate wrote a title and put it on the cross. And the writing was Jesus of Nazareth, the King of the Jews. Now, let me tell you a little something. The Muslims say that Jesus was not crucified. Okay? Well, right here in my Bible, which the Muslims don't believe because they've got their little Quran written by their little Muhammad, it says Jesus was crucified. The Jews, in a book called the Talmud, which is a Jewish commentary of the Bible, it's, it's the opinions, the written opinions of a bunch of different rabbis. They, they acknowledge that Jesus was crucified. Okay? I mean, you're talking people that don't believe the claims of Jesus. So you got the Christians that know Jesus was crucified. You've got the Jews that don't acknowledge Jesus, but yet they know that Jesus was crucified. And then you've got Roman historians that didn't believe in Jesus either, and they know that Jesus was crucified. The only ones that don't know that Jesus was crucified is the Muslims. And there's a college in Orlando, Florida, called Rollins, R-O-L-L-I-N-S, had a, a, a Muslim teacher. This just happened. Today is March 30th, 2017. Uh, a, he said, Jesus was not crucified. A Christian student said, oh, yes, he was. Disagreed with the professor. Professor had him suspended. Now, this is not a Bible college. It's a liberal arts, non-Christian college. But, okay, but you got Christians, Jews, and his, Roman historians all say Jesus was crucified. But a Muslim teacher says, no, he wasn't. And the Christian student gets suspended. Really? Really? So. And Pilate, verse 19, and Pilate wrote a title and put it on the cross. And the writing was, Jesus of Nazareth, the king of the Jews. This title then read many of the Jews for the place where Jesus was crucified was nigh to the city, and it was written in Hebrew and Greek and Latin. Hebrew was the language of the scholarly Jews. Greek was the common language of commerce. If you lived in Judea, uh, years prior, prior to the Romans, the Greeks had conquered Judea. As a matter of fact, Alexander the Great had conquered most of the Middle East. I mean, he had, that's why he was called Alexander the Great, because his empire was great. Not because he was a good man, just, you know, he conquered a huge area. And, uh, you know, when you conquer an area, uh, guess what language you're going to learn? The conqueror's language. I mean, that's just the way it is. So, and then along comes the Romans, and then they conquered the area that the Greeks had conquered. So if you were a Hebrew businessman, 
and you had dealings with the Roman government, you'd speak Hebrew in the synagogue on the Sabbath. When you were doing business, you would probably speak Greek. And when you went to pay your taxes, you would speak Latin, which was the, the Roman language, the official Roman language. People were trilingual. This title then read many of the Jews, for the place where Jesus was crucified was nigh to the city, and it was written in Hebrew and Greek and Latin. Then said the chief priests of the Jews, see, this is proof. Then said the chief priests of the Jews, not the Roman Catholic priests. Then said the chief priests of the Jews to Pilate, Write not the king of the Jews, but that he said... I am the king of the Jews. Pilate answered, What I have written, I have written. Then the soldiers, when they had crucified Jesus, took his garments and made four parts to every soldier apart, and also his coat. Now the coat was without seam, woven from the top throughout. They said, Therefore among themselves, let us not rend it. You know, don't let us not tear it. You know, divide it into four pieces, right? Let us not rend it, but cast lots for it. You know, they're going to, like, draw straws or, you know, they're going to gamble for it, basically. Let us not rend it, but cast lots for it, whose it shall be, that the scripture might be fulfilled, which saith, they parted my raiment among them, and for my vesture they did cast lots. These things, therefore, the soldiers did. Now there stood by the cross of Jesus, his mother, and his mother's sister, Mary, the wife of Cleophas, and Mary Magdalene. When Jesus therefore saw his mother and the disciple standing by whom he loved, he saith unto his mother, Woman, behold thy son. Then said he to the disciple, Behold thy mother. And from that hour that disciple took her unto his own home. After this, Jesus saying, oh, I'm sorry, Jesus knowing that all things were now accomplished, that the scripture might be fulfilled, saith, I thirst. Now there was a there was set a vessel full of vinegar, and they filled a sponge with vinegar and put it upon hyssop and put it to his mouth. When Jesus therefore had received the vinegar, he said, It is finished. It is finished. It is finished. And he bowed his head and gave up the ghost. It is finished. Uh, so Jesus didn't say, well, it's almost finished, but we got to wait until Muhammad comes, you know, and, and Muhammad's going to come and, 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 you know, be a greater prophet than me. Oh yeah. The Muslims teach that Muhammad is even a greater prophet than Jesus. Huh? Well, let's see what the Bible says about that. You see, Jesus said, it is finished. Uh, he didn't say it's almost finished. It's almost finished, but we got one more prophet coming and his name's Muhammad. Uh-uh, Jesus didn't say that. No, he said it is finished. And he bowed his head and gave up the ghost. He said it is finished and he bowed his head and he gave up the ghost. That's it, people. It's finished. What does Paul say about uh, this Muhammad? Well, he doesn't mention him by name, but in the book of Galatians, chapter 1, verse 8, but though we or an angel from heaven, did Muhammad claim that an angel from heaven by the name of, I think it was Gabriel, visited him and gave him another gospel? But though we, or an angel from heaven, preach any other gospel unto you than that which we have preached unto you, let him be accursed. Some people would say accursed. You've heard the, the Caribbean, Caribbean, tomato, tomato. But though we, or an angel from heaven, preach any other gospel unto you, than that which we have preached unto you, let him be accursed. Do you know 
People that preach another gospel, they're cursed. They're cursed of God. It's If you don't want, know what a curse means, it's the opposite of being blessed. I would rather have God's blessing than God be cursed. Verse 9. As we said before, so say I now again. If any man, Muhammad, if any man preach any other gospel unto you than that ye have received, let him be accursed. For do I now persuade men or God, or do I seek to please men? For if I yet please men, I should not be the servant of Christ. All right, let's go take a look. I think I've laid enough groundwork that uh, now we're going to read what the uh, what they have to say from their own writings. Let's take a look. Now this website, you can find this website from their own writings. Okay, the. Um, it's in the description box below. You can look at the link. You can click on it yourself. You can see that I am not just making this up. I am going to read their own writings about how they feel about Jesus being a prophet. It's from uh, www.noahide.com backslash y e s h u dot h t m you could either type it in yourself or you can just go to the description box below the video click on the link open it up in a new window read it word for word i'm not going to read the whole thing i'm going to read some excerpts who was jesus question mark they asked this question the Bible gave a, I'm, I'm quoting from their web, this website, noahide.com. Who is Jesus? Quote, the Bible gave a warning about a dangerous false prophet. Dangerous false prophet. Who would arise to test our faith in G-D? God, right? In Deuteronomy 13, G-D describes this false prophet. As a member of the Jewish people, verses 2 and 7, who would tell true prophecies and who would have the power of miracles? G.D. himself would give this false prophet the power to perform miracles and reveal prophecy, but the false prophet would try to seduce the people away from G.D.'s law and toward strange gods unknown to Judaism. The purpose would be to test whether we are truly committed to living under the law or whether we will be dazzled and fall for the temptation to join a false path to salvation. In this biblical passage, G.D. repeatedly commands the Jews to kill this false prophet lest the evil spread and destroy many souls. Oh, wait a minute. Uh, uh, wait a minute. Uh, the, the Muslims think that Jesus is a sinless prophet. Um, but here this other group says he's a false prophet. Huh. Well, let's, let's keep reading here. To be accepted by the people, the false prophet would sometimes pretend to be a righteous Jew who fulfills the law. But at key moments... He would turn against certain details of the law in order to make the breach. This is the reason that verse 1 commands us not to add or subtract any details from the law, and verse 5 warns us to remain steadfast with all the traditions of the law. Traditions of the law. We're talking about Deuteronomy 13 here, okay? In Deuteronomy 17, this false prophet is also described as someone who would rebel against the authority of the judges of the Jewish people, and who would be put to death for his rebelliousness. Deuteronomy 17, verses 18 through 13, especially verse 12. Who are the judges? 
The highest court in Israel was the Sanhedrin, which was established by Moses. Exodus 18, verses 13 through 26. Numbers 11, uh, chapters 11, verses 16 through 29, and which lasted more than nine, uh, 15 centuries. The members of the Sanhedrin were the rabbis known as the Pharisees. Remember I told you Pharisees were Jews? The members of the Sanhedrin were the rabbis known as Pharisees. And then it goes, uh, Pishram, those with the explanation. God gave permanent authority to these judges to interpret the law and God's word. And it is a commandment to follow their decisions without turning even slightly to the right or to the left. Deuteronomy 17, verse 11. But the false prophet, Jesus, but the false prophet would challenge the authority of the Sanhedrin, thus revealing himself to be an evil man. Ooh. In the book of the prophet Daniel, this false prophet was described as a king, the eleventh horn on a terrible beast who would wage war against the Jews, the holy ones. See Deuteronomy 14.2 on this term. And who would change the law, including the calendar and the holidays, Daniel 7, verse 8, and verses 20 through 25. Elsewhere, this false prophet is described as a king who would disregard the God of his fathers, exalting himself as a God and giving honor to this new Godhead, Daniel 11, verses 36 through 39. The man known today as Jesus fulfilled all these prophecies. He became a king over the Christian church who changed the original law, doing away with the Hebrew calendar and the biblical holidays, Rosh Hashanah, Yom Kippur, Sukkos, and the festival of the tabernacles, Passover, etc. He disregarded the one infinite God of the Hebrew Bible in favor of a new trinity that included himself, and he repeatedly broke the law by committing terrible sins while openly challenging the God-given authority of the rabbis of the Sanhedrin. Hmm. Next uh, paragraph. Naturally, Jesus did sometimes pretend to respect the law, but whenever he thought he could get away with it, he turned right around and broke the same law. In Matthew 5, verses 17 through 19, he declared that he came to fulfill the law. And in Matthew 23, verses 1 and 3, he defended the authority of the rabbis, but the rest of the time he rebelled against the law, thus showing that his occasional words of piety were meant only to hide his evil agenda. The following sins of Jesus are recorded in the, quote, New Testament, unquote. The following sins of Jesus. One, Jesus repudiated the laws of kosher food, Mark 7, verses 18 and 19. Compare this to the prophet Daniel's strict adherence to Kashurus in Daniel chapter 1. That's kosher. Second, he repudiated the laws of honoring one's parents and called on his followers to hate their parents. He also dishonored his own mother. Oh, Matthew 10, verses 34 through 36. Matthew 12, verses 46 through 50. And Luke 14, 26. Number three. He violated the Sabbath by picking grain and incited his disciples to do the same. Matthew 12, verses 1 through 8, Mark 2, chapter 23 through 26. Four, he vi again violated the Sabbath by healing a man's arm, which was not a matter of life, saving a life, and he openly defiled the rabbis in his total repudiation of the Sabbath. Oh... Matthew chapter 12, verses 9 through 13, and Mark 3, 1 through 5. Compare this to God's view of violating the Sabbath in Numbers 15, verses 32 through 36, and Nehemiah 10, verses 30 through 32, and dozens of other places throughout the Bible. Jesus, number five, Jesus brazenly defied and disobeyed the rabbis of the Sanhedrin, repudiating their authority. This is recorded in many places throughout the New Testament, but look especially at Matthew chapter 23. Christians, read Matthew 23, especially verses 13 through 39, 
And John chapter 44, John 8, chapter 8, verses 44 and 45. And then, like I said, you should read John chapter 8. The Talmud, Talmud means learning. The Talmud, Babylonian edition, Babylonian edition, Babylon? Do you know that means the, the, the learning Babylonian edition? Learning from Babylon? Think about that next time you hear about Mystery Babylon the Great. See, the Talmud is their uh, commentary on the Bible. It's the opinions of the rabbis. The Talmud, Babylonian edition, records other sins, sins of Jesus of Nazareth. Oh, it gets really good here. Number one, he and his disciples practiced sorcery and black magic. Ooh, Jesus practiced sorcery and black magic. What an evil, horrible person he was. Oh, that's mine. Never mind. He and his disciples practiced sorcery and black magic, led Jews astray into idolatry, and were sponsored by foreign Gentile purposes for the, for the purpose of subverting Jewish worship. That's in the uh, book of Sanhedrin, chapter 43, subpart A. Number two, he was sexually immoral. Christians, do you believe, number two, do you believe Jesus was sexually immoral? He was sexually immoral, worshipped statues of stone, a brick is mentioned, was cut off from the Jewish people for his wickedness and refused to repent. Book of Sanhedrin, chapter 107, subpart B, and Sota, S-O-T-A-H, 47A. Verse number three. He learned witchcraft in Egypt and to perform miracles. Isn't that interesting? That even the Jews admit that Jesus performed miracles. He learned witchcraft in Egypt and to perform miracles, used procedures that involve cutting his flesh, which is also explicitly banned in the Bible. Shabos, S-H-A-B-B-O-S, 104, part B. Wow. All right, so let's see, next paragraph. The false rebellious message of Jesus has been thoroughly rejected by the vast majority of the Jewish people as God commanded. Unfortunately, however, the same message has brought a terrible darkness upon the world today. Wow, I thought Jesus was the light of the world. But the Jews say this same message has brought a terrible darkness upon the world today. Over 1.5 billion Gentiles believe in Jesus. These lost souls mistakenly think they have found salvation in Jesus. Oh, you lost souls, you think you found salvation in Jesus? Tragically, they are in for a rude awakening. Truth and eternal life are found directly from God through performing his law. Truth and eternal life are found directly from God through performing his law? Did you know that Jews believe in salvation by law? Any mediator only separates man from God. Huh. Okay. Now, uh, then they have uh, one through six reasons why Jesus is not well, it says, number one, is God is not a man who can lie, nor the son of man who relents. He has not beholden iniquity in Jacob, nor has he seen perverseness in Israel. Numbers 23, verse 19. Um, uh, verse 6, I mean, I'm, I'm sorry, number 6. Israel is saved in Hashem with an eternal salvation. Assemble yourselves and come, come near together, you Gentiles who have, have escaped the judgment. They have no knowledge. Those who carry wooden sculptures and pray to a God that does not save. Announce them, bring near, even take counsel, who declared this from ancient times and announced it from them. Is it not I, Hashem? And there are no other gods beside me, nor any righteous 
and saving God, other me, turn to me and be saved, all ends of the earth, for I am God and there is none else. By myself I swore a righteous word went out from my mouth, and it will not be withdrawn, that to me every knee will bow and every tongue will swear. Isaiah 45, verses 17, uh, then 20 through 23. Now listen carefully. Quote, what is the true key to salvation? Question. Unquote. And then quote, the answer. What is the true key to salvation? Those who return to the law, the seven commandments for the children of Noah. Huh? Those who return to the law, the seven commandments for the children of Noah? Where's that in the Bible? Where's the seven laws of Noah in the Bible? It's not. It's not. There are no seven laws of Noah in the Bible. You know where they come from? This Babylonian Talmud, the learning from Babylon, Mystery Babylon the Great. You see, people, we don't have to worry about Sharia law in the United States. we got to worry about the Noahide law. Do you know that the Noahide laws were signed into law by President Reagan? And they were reaffirmed by President Bush. Do you know what the seven laws of Moses of Noah say? That any idolater should be put to death. And you know what an idolater is in the mind of, a, of these Noahide people? If you believe in Jesus as Emmanuel, as God in the flesh, if you believe your faith your salvation is faith in Christ. To these Noahide Jews, you are an idolater and you should be put to death. Read Matthew 24. It says that you'll be brought, you'll be brought to the synagogues and have your heads cut off. Guess what the method of execution for the Noahide laws is? Beheading. Coincidence or the word of God? Let's keep reading this. What is the true key to salvation? Those who return to the law, the seven commandments for the children of Noah, according to the eternal covenant made with Noah in Genesis 9, and who assist the Jewish people, Isaiah 60, 61, and 66, and those who assist the Jewish people will be saved and will participate in the miracles and revelations, including worshiping in the third temple. Did you know that there are two, now this is my note, did you know that there's two Jewish groups that want to rebuild the temple? The Temple Mount Faithful and the Temple Institute. Look them up. They want to, Jesus said it is finished. The Jews say, nope, we got to rebuild the temple and start doing animal blood sacrifices. Because the blood of Jesus, it ain't good enough for us. So, and who assists the Jewish people will be saved and will participate in the miracles and revelations, including worshiping in the third temple under the kingship of the Messiah. Which Messiah? Not Christ, the king. Must be the Antichrist, the beast, the man of sin, the son of perdition. Under the kingship of the Messiah, as described in many places, including Jeremiah 16, verses 19 through 21, and Zechariah 8, 20 and 23, all the old Gentile religions of the world will disappear. See, uh, what's a Gentile religion? Christianity will disappear. And their followers were turned to the Jews for spiritual leadership. Until then, Christians are spiritually blinded. Did you know you're spiritually blinded according to the mind of a Jew? Until then, Christians are spiritually blinded and cannot yet understand God's wisdom in the Bible. Ours is the, is the last generation of the era of sin and sin and evil, and the first of the messianic era. Indeed, for the first time in history, there is a growing consensus of leading rabbis willing to name the most studied, the, the man most suited to be the Messiah, and they are agreeing that he is the Lubavitcher, Reb, Rabbi Menachem Mendel Schneerson, the Reb. 
is the spiritual leader of our generation. Oh, guess what, people? He died. And he's still dead. The Reb is the spiritual leader of our generation, having boldly stir up controversy over vital issues in which other leaders have remained tragically silenced or have even caved into the growing forces of darkness. He has upheld the law perfectly. Do you believe our Jewish rabbi upheld the law perfectly? Wrong. And has worked mightily to strengthen the observance of the law by Jews as well as the observance of the Noahide law by Gentiles. You see, they want you to keep the laws of Noah, which is not in the Bible, by the way. It's the Noahide laws are only in the mind of a Jew. Through his teaching of Chalcedius, Jewish mystical teachings. Jewish mystical teachings? That's another fancy way of saying, that's a nice way of saying magic. Jewish mystical teachings preserved from Moses and Mount Sinai. He was taught the world that God is one, the infinite, who renews creation at every moment. The Reb is a direct descendant of King David and has received a true prophecy from God that we who are alive in this generation shall, shall be the first in history to see the coming of the true Messiah, not Jesus, the Antichrist people. To see the coming of the true Messiah, many Jews are e eagerly awaiting the Reb's resurrection from the grave, ready to reestablish the Sanhedrin and anoint the king. Our job is to finish preparing the way by announcing the truth and bringing all of mankind back to the law immediately. Through our divinely mandated efforts, we shall now clear the path for the return of the Garden of Eden and the establishment of the eternal sinless world promised by Isaiah and other biblical prophets. You see, people, to the Jews, their key of salvation is the law, not faith in Christ. And you think Sharia law is the problem? No. The Noahide law is the problem. Every Christian in the mind of a Jew is guilty of idolatry, and the first law says you're punishable by death, by beheading. Go to John chapter 16. These things have I spoken unto you, that ye should not be offended. They shall put you out of the synagogues. Who hangs out at the synagogues? Jews, right? They shall put you out of the synagogues, yea, the time cometh that whosoever killeth you will think that he doeth God's service. And these things will they do unto you because they have not known the Father nor me. That's Jesus in John chapter 16, verses 1, 2, and 3. All right, let's take a look at the seven Noahide laws. N-O-A-H-I-D-E. One, do not deny God. Two, do not blaspheme God. Uh, do you know that Christians blaspheme God according to the Jews that came up with this? Because, hey, you believe in Jesus, the false prophet, the the wicked sinner, the evil man, uh, the sexually immoral who practiced sorcery and witchcraft. Yeah, that that's that Jesus that the Jews say. I disagree, but that's how they believe. Number three, do not murder. Number four, do not engage in illicit sexual relations. Five, do not steal. Six, do not eat from a live animal. Uh, seven, here's the important thing. Establish courts, legal systems, to assure obedience to above said laws. And what is the punishment, method of punishment, if you uh, blaspheme God? Death. Death. By beheading. You see, people, you don't have to worry about Sharia law. It's the Noahide laws. Because Jews are expecting a different Messiah than a Christian. Matter of fact, if you look at the seven laws of Noah under uh, what I call Wikipedia, Wikipedia, 
Um, you could read, in uh, it says, Public Recognition, United States. In 1987, President Ronald Reagan signed a proclamation speaking of, and I quote, the historical tradition of ethical values and principles which have been the bedrock of society from the dawn of civilization, where they were known as the seven Noah high laws transmitted through God to Moses on Mount Sinai. And in 1991, Congress stated in the preamble to the 1991 bill that established Education Day in honor of the birthday of Menachem Mendel Schneerson, the leader of the Chabad, Chabad, C-H-A-B-A-D, movement, unquote. Um, Chabad, perhaps you've heard of them. They're called the Lubavitch, L-U-B-A-V-I-T-C-H. Uh, you ever heard of Kabbalah, K-A-B-B-A-L-L-A-H? Wow, you've got Allah, his name, in the Jewish Kabbalah. Sometimes it's spelled K A B A L L A A. I mean A L A H, one L, not two. Uh, sometimes Kabbalah is spelled with a Q. Sometimes it's spelled with a um, K. Sometimes it's spelled with a, a C. I mean, there's different ways of spelling it, you know. So, but they're the ones. Kabbalah is magic. Yeah, you know Madonna's religion. Yeah, I, I'm serious. Look this stuff up. Look up, uh, you know, I'm not making this stuff up. And while you're worried about the Noahide, I mean, the, uh, the, the Sharia law, the Noahide laws are coming in. You know, I mean, and if you blaspheme God by believing that Jesus Christ is the mediator between man and God, well... You're a blasphemer, according to the Jews. So, what does the Bible say? Let's take a look. And like I said, the method of execution was beheading. Did you know that in Obamacare, they actually have a code in the... Uh, they have what's called a medical code. Like, let's say you died of poisoning or an overdose or gunshot. They have actually have medical codes that they write in for, like, your, in your medical chart in a hospital. Well, everything's, they don't have charts anymore. It's more computerized now. But um, let's say you went in for whatever liver problems, breathing problems. They've got all these codes that they use instead of writing out uh, pulmonary coronary thrombosis, which is like a blood clot, right? Instead of writing that, you'd write down like, you know, CB-1034 or something, whatever. I'm just making it up. But um, they actually have, they actually have a code for beheading in Obamacare. People don't believe me. In Revelation chapter 20, verse 4, And I saw thrones, and they sat upon them, and judgment was given unto them. And I saw the souls, the souls of them that were beheaded, beheaded. You ever heard somebody say, oh man, he lost his head. Yeah. And I saw the souls of them that were beheaded for the witness of Jesus and for the word of God, and which had not worshipped the beast, neither his image, neither had received his mark upon their foreheads or in their hands, and they lived and reigned with Christ a thousand years. People, how come you've never heard this before in church? I tell you what, look up Kabbalah, K A B B A L A H or K A B B A or K A B A L L A H. You know, the religion of Madonna, okay? Magic, Satanism, witchcraft. This is what these Jews believe. You know, they don't believe the words of the Bible. 
They really don't. They believe other weird stuff that I've never heard of. Tell you what, one more verse. Let's go to Revelation chapter 3, verse 9. Behold, Jesus speaking, Behold, I will make them of the synagogue of Satan. Who's he talking about? These people that practice Kabbalah. Kabbalah is magic. It's Satanism. It's witchcraft. And yet they accuse Jesus of doing the same thing that they do. Do you know there's over 300 uh, Lubavitch centers that practice Kabbalah in the United States alone? There's a thousand centers worldwide. There's over 300 in the United States. Most of them are New York City, uh, of which New York City is 25% Jewish people. There's two million Jews living in New York City. Um, the second largest is Los Angeles, and the third largest is South Florida, mainly Miami, Fort Lauderdale, and West Palm Beach area. So Jesus said, verse, Revelation chapter 3 and verse 9, Behold, I will make them of the synagogue of Satan, which say they are Jews and are not, but do lie. Behold, I will make them to come and worship before thy feet and to know that I have loved thee. Because thou hast kept the word of my patience, I will also keep thee from the hour of temptation which shall come upon all the world to try them that dwell upon the earth. You see, people, Islam, Muslims, and Sharia law is a smokescreen. Christianity is dying, people. Do you know that by Bible definition, let's read the Bible definition of, it, of Antichrist. Let's read the Bible definition. Matter of fact, let's take a look at that right now. Take your Bible, your King James Bible, and turn to the first chapter. I'm sorry, first John. There's first, second, and third John. Go to first John chapter two, verse twenty-two. Who is a liar? But he that denieth that Jesus is the Christ. Christ is just a Greek rendering of, of Messiah. You see, the New Testament was written in Greek, not Hebrew. It was written in Greek. So who is a liar? But he that denieth that Jesus is the Christ. He is Antichrist that denieth the Father and the Son. Whosoever denieth the Son, the same hath not the Father. But he that acknowledgeth the Son hath the Father also. So anybody that denies that Jesus is the Christ or the Messiah is Antichrist. He not only denies the Son, but he denies the Father that sent the Son. Because it says in verse 23, Whosoever denieth the Son, the same hath not the Father. So if you don't have the Son... You don't have the Father either. But he that acknowledgeth the Son hath the Father also. So if Jews do not accept Jesus as their Messiah, who is their Messiah? John, go to the book of John, the Gospels, chapter 3 and verse 36. He that believeth on the Son hath everlasting life. And he that believeth not the Son shall not see life, but the wrath of God abideth on him. He that believeth on the Son hath everlasting life, and he that believeth not the Son shall not see life, but the wrath of God abideth on him. Do you know that Jews that don't believe in Jesus, the wrath of God is on them? Did you know that? 
So, all right, well, quit worrying about Sharia law. This is Chaplain Bob Walker, Light of the World Ministries. In John 8, 12, Jesus said, I am the light of the world. He that followeth me shall not walk in darkness, but shall have the light of life. All blessings, praise, glory, and honor.